Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth, presented by Associates for Biblical Research. I'm your host, Henry Smith. Today, I'm very excited to have a guest returning to the program, Dr. Todd Bolin. He's here to join us today to talk about one of really the most fascinating discoveries in Jerusalem, known as Hezekiah's Tunnel. Dr. Bolin, welcome back to Digging for Truth. It's great to have you back on. Thank you, Henry. I'm happy to be back with you. All right, well, for, for those who are veterans of the show, you've been on the show before, so we wanna refer them back to those previous episodes to find out about, a little bit about your ministry and background. One of those was about the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem. But today, uh, we're gonna go back in time a little bit before that and talk about really what is one of the most extraordinary discoveries and artifacts, if you wanna call it that, uh, in Jerusalem, and that is Hezekiah's Tunnel. So. Todd, I'm going to let you uh, go ahead and get started with the most basic of questions. What, what is Hezekiah's Tunnel? Hezekiah's Tunnel is a, a water tunnel underneath ancient Jerusalem that uh, was carved by Hezekiah's men. We know that because it's in the Bible, and uh, that's what makes it so exciting because we have uh, not just this ancient, I mean, if we just had a tunnel, I mean, everybody loved just walking through this ancient tunnel, there's water still flowing through it, but the fact that it's mentioned in the Bible, and, and more than once, it's in both Kings and Chronicles, um, just makes the connection so you can just feel like you're, you know, living 2,700 years ago, really nothing's changed underground, you're walking through solid rock, you know, the uh, cut through the limestone, and it's channeling the water, so this is what it does, it brings the water from one uh, side of Jerusalem, one valley, uh, where it was apparently exposed, that seems to be the, the motivation for it, uh, where it would have been accessible to the invaders, like the Assyrians were a big threat at the time, and brought it inside the city walls uh, through, the, through the solid rock, like I said, to uh, the Pool of Siloam. And maybe it'd just be good here to read the, the two passages where it's mentioned explicitly. It's really, it's really neat. I mean, you think about this tunnel uh, in the Bible, it, at the end of Hezekiah's reign, in the book of Second Kings, uh, chapter 20, verse 20, it says, As for the other events of Hezekiah's reign, all his achievements and how he made the pool and the tunnel by which he brought water into the city, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? So just think about that. I mean, they're, uh, the, the biblical writer is summarizing Hezekiah's reign. He's saying, oh, there's a lot of other things that happened. And, and one of those was, Hezekiah's tunnel. So it seems like he was known for that at the time. And that was like a singular accomplishment among all the other things to be remembered by. And, and a little more detail in 2 Chronicles 32.30, it says, it was Hezekiah who blocked the upper outlet of the Gihon Spring and channeled the water down to the west side of the city of David. He succeeded in everything he undertook. And uh, so there, a little more information again, how he uh, uh, brought the water from one side, you know, to the other side. And uh, that's exactly what Hezekiah's tunnel does. So you're thinking about like, is this the right tunnel or is there another tunnel or whatever? Hezekiah's tunnel does just what the Bible says that it does. And so it's a very clear connection. Yeah, it's an e uh, excellent summary. Now, some of our audience may notice that I have our Shiloh excavation uh, t shirt that I'm wearing, and part of inviting people to Israel is that we do tours before the dig and after the dig, and it almost always includes a tour through Hezekiah's Tunnel because it's so important. So uh, we're going to fast forward to today and then go backwards, but tell us a little bit about what it's like uh, today. Right, so you can visit. This is not you know, something that's like protected or whatever, uh, tourists can pay a small fee in order to walk through the tunnel and experience it for themselves. And like I said, it's it, it, for people who are in, you know, the physical condition to be able to walk through a narrow tunnel for a long time. I mean, it's a, a can't miss uh, opportunity. Uh, in the old days, I mean, I uh, 20 plus years ago, the way you would enter into the tunnel was from the Kidron Valley. So the the Gihon Spring originally, I mean, for thousands of years, it emerges at the the base of the slope of the city of David, and and flows into the into the Kidron Valley. And then when Hezekiah channeled it, you know, t uh, through the through the tunnel, then it was going to go the other direction. But you could access it, and there's steps 
Uh, there we have old photographs of, of people standing on the steps and walking down the steps. And originally, when I was bringing students there 30 years ago, we would go down those steps from the Kidron Valley and straight into the tunnel. Um, today, they have rerouted things. And there's a couple of reasons for it. One is just for some safety um, issues. Sometimes the there's concerns with the Jewish people there in, in the uh, area and the Arab residents, that it's a mixed neighborhood. Uh, but also, one advantage of the, the new way you do it, if, if you're going to do this, you, you can't just walk down the Kidron Valley and walk through the tunnel. You have to uh, come to the entrance center, the visitor center on top of the city of David, where you'll uh, be given a ticket, and then you're going to pass through Warren Shaft system. And that's another tunnel that gets you down to the uh, pool tower and the spring tower these are relatively newer excavations the last what 15 years or so and and then from there down more steps till you get to the the Gihon spring and and passing through the tunnel you know we tell you know visitors before we go like it is narrow if you're claustrophobic or whatever it's, you're going to be in there a long time there's an alternate way you know so you don't have to go through the tunnel if you don't want to but but it's a uh, it's just a fun little trek. You're uh, sometimes you have to duck because they didn't make the ceiling very high, <laughs> uh, but sometimes the ceiling's really high and and the water's flowing. I mean, you're getting wet, so you know we tell everybody bring your your water shoes or your sandals. You can't go barefoot because the the you know the floor is you know not very even for footing. But um, and the and the water is uh, like I said flowing the whole way. You're getting wet. Used to so when you know back uh, like I said 25 some years ago the water level was be chest height. So we had some of the shorter people and, you know, you're like, <laughs> like you know, standing on your tiptoes or whatever. I mean, I don't think it's ever quite that bad, but, but then they were able to clear some of the blockage out at the end and the water level is now about mid thigh height. So it's really quite pleasant, you know, initially feels kind of chilly when you get in, but, but it's just a pleasant walk. It's cool. Even in the like, hottest of the summer, it's a nice cool walk underground through the tunnel. It's about a third of a mile in, in length, so uh, that's a half a kilometer, 1,750 feet, and, and I will just kind of prep my students and say, uh, we're going to be there for about uh, 30, it's going to take us about 30 minutes, and we're not rushing, but uh, just to walk through and kind of keep, you know, eye out for different, there's different things to see along the way, and uh, it's, it's about a 30-minute trek until you emerge at the other end. Well, excellent. That's a great summary. Uh, some of those things that you can see along the way, we're going to pick up in our next segment. And um, I do, I do want to encourage people who have ever thought about going to Israel to, to join us, perhaps for the Shiloh dig, and they could go on a tour of the tunnel, which we're going to dis, uh, explore more in our next segment. And friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth here. We're here with Dr. Todd Bolin, and we'll be right back. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archeological field work and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm Henry Smith, and I'm here with Dr. Todd Bolin. We're here talking about Hezekiah's tunnel. All right, Todd, so uh, you kind of gave the basic rundown. Uh, we fast forwarded to today to say, you know, what would it be like to go in through the tunnel? So uh, let's explore some of the things that you actually see when you're in there, uh, when you walk through this approximately third of a mile uh, tunnel. Yeah, so it's it's just a fascinating trip but one disadvantage I and mean, there's a lot to see and i want to kind of walk our viewers through that but it's tough if you're if you're uh you know you're with your guide or your professor um because he can't gather everybody together and say hey look at this because once you're in the tunnel it's just single file the whole way right um and what i'll you know i'll i'll do is i'll say okay everybody when i get to this certain point like where they met that's a neat thing in the middle uh, i'm gonna like point it out and pass it on back and 
you know, if you have 30, 40 students behind you, you're never quite sure, you know, what it's like by the time it gets to the end, you know, the game of telephone and what they're saying or whatever. But so, so maybe even this little tour here could be useful, even for those who've been through the tunnel and maybe they weren't able to hear everything or they were, you know, taking pictures or distracted or whatever. But when you go in, the, here's, here's the first thing, is the Gihon Spring. So uh, that's gushing out um, from the staircase, just underneath the stairs. When you first step in, that's where the, the water emerges. And, and like I said, it feels a little bit chilly. And um, there's a little bit of a cave there that's distinctive. It doesn't kind of feel like a tunnel. It feels like you're in a little bit of a cave, especially if you got your light and kind of flash it around. You can see that. And um, then you, you uh, are going to continue on through into the tunnel. The initial part, there's a couple of turns there. And, and one of them is... A, uh, where it where it turns, there's a, a portion where there used to be a passage that's been blocked up, and that leads to the base of Warren's shaft. So, and that even using that name is a little bit tricky. Uh, Charles Warren was an explorer in Jerusalem in the 1860s, so it gets its name after him, and he climbed up this shaft. And the theory was, and it's now um, there's some significant problems with this theory in. In, in its original formulation, that that was the way that people inside the city would lower their buckets to get water without going outside the city. Uh, and it was also s s surmised that that was the way that Joab, when he was leading David's army, captured the city by climbing up that shaft. Now, like I said, there's some problems with that, and maybe we won't uh, go into that right now, but that's the one of the you know features you see. And of course, it raises these questions and people who want to study this more like, so what was that shaft and when was it carved and what does it have to do? But as you continue on, um, uh, the, the height's gonna get, uh, the tunnel is gonna decrease. So like I said, in places you're gonna be ducking and um, then it gets a little higher. It's always narrow. And, and why would that be? That Maybe this is kind of an obvious point, but but it's a lot of work, right, to carve this tunnel out, and they don't want to make it wider than they need to. And they, they needed it to be, of course, one person width because a person had to get through to, you know, use their pickaxe and to, you know, keep uh, chiseling uh, along, but not any wider than that. And um, But but then it you're going to arrive, and this is maybe my favorite uh, feature to, to, to point out, is the place where they met. And I want to talk a little bit about that more. Um, in, in a bit, but for right now, you can see the pl literally. I mean, you can see the place where the two sides met, and, and, and you see it because, for one, the ceiling dips down a little bit. There's just a place where the the ceiling gets a little bit lower, just for just a couple feet, really. Um, and I, you know, I assume they just when they met, they didn't feel like, hey, we don't need to clear that out anymore. What's the point? We're not, you know, chiseling out anymore. And, and the other thing, if you look closely, you can see the pick marks. I mean, they're pick marks the whole way, of course, but what you're seeing here is the pick marks coming from one direction, and then when you hit the meeting point, now they're coming from the other direction. And uh, it's, it's just neat to, to imagine, especially when we think about the inscription that was found that, that I'm going to talk about when we get to it, but uh, that describes how they met together. Now, just past the meeting point, there's a couple of things that break this rule. I said like it's single file the whole way. Um, there's there's three different places where there's a separate pa passage. It's, it's a false turn. It only goes just for a few feet. You actually can't go anywhere. Although if you need to pass somebody or whatever, you could you know step aside just for that. But but that's very interesting because it indicates that the people who are coming from the south. They they misjudged it at a, at a few points and they were started to chisel one way and then they had to course correct and we don't know like why do they have to course correct i mean we don't we don't this is big one of the big unresolved questions is how did they do it um but one thing the false turns tell us is that they, they made a few mistakes along the way and as you keep on going there's a, another feature now i i haven't seen this I just heard about this. was just published in, in a few months ago on an article on, on the web uh, that describes uh, the remains of a sluice gate. So this is really neat, and the article is really technical, uh, describing things that are you know beyond my my knowledge or even in interest in some regards. The big question is, what was that doing there? I mean, why was there a gate 
that was des designed to stop the water. Or I think it's more likely it's designed to raise the level of the water. And there apparently was a mechanism outside up above where they could control the sluice gate. And so there's, I mean, like I said, this is a brand new discovery. Right. And there's just beginning discussion about this and what it means. But that's another thing. I mean, next time I'm going through, I'm going to be keeping my eyes out for the remains of that. Okay. Well, we're getting close excellent. to the end. Go ahead. No, no, I was just saying I, I, that's a, that's excellent. I do I do want to stop you there just for a moment. I, I'd like you to comment. We have about a minute in this segment. Um, f first of all, the thought is uh, they had did not have modern equipment or anything like that. So this was no small task. That's obvious. Twenty seven hundred years ago. How long did it take? And kind of like what was the political situation? Who was in rule? We have Hezekiah, but give the audience that. We got about a minute to cover that. Yes. So we don't know how long it took. Uh, I mean, I suppose they could do, you know, you know, get some primitive tools, iron tools, and and see how long it takes. We, you know, when I was living in Israel and teaching at the Israel Bible Extension, we had a few opportunities to excavate in the area around Hezekiah's Tunnel. And I know this, that we were just uh, taking out uh, dirt uh, from some uh, auxiliary tunnels there. Uh, part of the system near the Gihon Spring, and that's just a lot of work. Even though it was loose dirt, relative, I mean, just been there for how many hundreds of years or whatever, and and then the bucket brigade and everything. So, I don't know. I mean, they could work 24/6, you know. I mean, around the clock because it's dark, you know. Outside doesn't matter. They need lights all the time anyway. Right. Um, but the Assyrians are invading, so that's what you alluded there. Um, that may give us a clue. Because if it began, this would be really the best chronological clue we have, whether or not it's right um, in, in this regard. And when Hezekiah rebelled against the Assyrians, Sennacherib, in the year 705 B.C., when Sennacherib came to the throne, and Sennacherib arrived uh, on his campaign in 701. So if the beginning of the tunnel was connected to the rebellion, then that gives us you know, up to four, four years. years. Yeah, right. that, makes, that, makes, that makes reasonable sense. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly. All right, we got to take a break, Todd. Uh, this is a phen phenomenal tour of this, this amazing artifact. We want to get to the inscription that you mentioned, and we'll do that right after this break. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research, written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint. Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm Henry Smith. We're here talking about Hezekiah's Tunnel with Dr. Todd Bolin. Okay, Todd, um, let's talk about maybe what may be the central feature of the tunnel, and that is what's called the Salome inscription. Uh, unbelievable discovery. Uh, let's talk about that. It is. It's the only monumental Hebrew inscription that's ever been found. We have seals and impressions, and we have fragments, and but this is a, a monumental Hebrew inscription. It was discovered in 1880 inside the tunnel. It was found, uh, it's all, along a wall. So this is, you know, the last thing I would point out uh, to a group uh, walking through the tunnel is the place where the inscription used to be. Now, it used to be there uh, because some thieves stole it uh, shortly after it was discovered in 1880. Uh, someone uh, hacked it out of the rock. Now, the uh, Ottoman officials uh, went to work. They found out who stole it. They recovered it, and they, they took it and put it in the, in the museum in Istanbul. And, and there it's on display. Um, and, uh, but you can still see the place where it was. There's, there's like a hole in the rock where it used to be. And, and uh, what, it, what it says, it's written, of course, in, in the old Hebrew script, and it was, it was not written by the king. So it's, a, it's interesting. It's a monumental inscription. Usually monumental inscriptions are royal inscriptions. This one's not. It's written by the workmen. It's from the perspective of the, the engineers and the builders, those who are working on it. And it describes 
how they met. I mean, uh, not as much about the whole process as about the end of the process. And let me just read some of it uh, to you. It talks about the day of the breach. This is the record of how the tunnel was breached. While they were uh, wielding their pickaxes, each man towards his coworker, and while there were yet three cubits for the breach, a voice was heard, each man calling to his co-worker because there was a cavity in the rock extending from the south to the north. So on the day of the breach, the excavator struck each man to meet his co-worker. Pickaxe against pickaxe. I mean, this is the, the moment that all these guys have been working for, you know, how long they've been slaving away. And they're just so excited. They met in the middle. We still don't know how they did it. We still don't know how they started from either end and met in the middle. Um... And then they say, the inscription ends just, uh, then the water flowed from the spring to the pool. That's the Gihon Spring to the Pool of Siloam, a distance of 1,200 cubits. And uh, yeah, we have brilliant engineering. Not only, not only that they met in the middle, uh, but the gradient is very slight. So they knew, they knew the levels on either end. They knew uh, how to... to you know, carve in such a way they weren't doing a lot of extra work. And uh, it's about one foot, roughly 12 inches uh, difference from the, the water level or the, the rock level at the beginning to at to the end. So just precision engineering um, in order to supply the city with water, probably uh, because of the threat of the Assyrians, they didn't want them to have access to the water. That's fascinating. You know, it never occurred to me before that we have here a whole bunch of things, the brilliant engineering, the hard work, but also these are not uh, scribes from the king's court, but an ordinary people who have literacy and are writing in full Paleo-Hebrew script. That's another, that's a story for another episode probably, but still, you know, very, very significant. I'm always amazed by the one foot drop over a period of 1,700 feet. That's quite remarkable. Uh, I'd like to make more commentary on that, but we should we should move ahead a little bit about you know the certainty of the date and connecting with Hezekiah. You wanted to make some comments about that. Uh, is there much dispute about the fact that this is Hezekiah's tunnel? I mean, I guess we could always have an outlier that says it isn't, but some thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, the nature of scholarship is to argue and debate everything, right? Right. <laughs> but but. Uh, that is relatively few for Hezekiah's tunnel. I mean, it's um, not quite unanimity, but the the tunnel matches so well the biblical text. And like I said, multiple biblical texts, Kings and Chronicles. And, and what we know of, we have so much evidence from the Assyrian side of things with their invasion and the campaign. And, and, and it just really comes together well. There was an attempt, what was it now, 20 years ago, maybe when uh, a couple of scholars published an article that tried to say the tunnel was Hasmonean, so carved 500 years later, and they faked the script. You know, they tried to make it look, you know, the old script or whatever, but that was really um, rejected quite quickly, and and I don't think anybody holds to that today. Roni Reich, who was uh, an archaeologist working in the area for, for a number of years um, and did some excellent work down there, he's thrown out a proposal that maybe is you know carved a little bit earlier than the time of Hezekiah. I, I don't know that anybody's really embraced that idea yet. So uh, you know I'm just happy to you know say and you know, to tell my students that um, that there's really no question that this tunnel is the same one when you're walking through it and it's the same tunnel that is mentioned in the Bible. Excellent. All right. Well, I hate to do this to you, Todd. I'm going to put you on the spot. You got you got about a minute to summarize the significance and importance of it, and I'll let you share in any way that you would like to do that to sum up the show. You know, the thing that I think makes Hezekiah so um, unique, I would say, I mean, it's, it's not uh, in a museum behind glass. You know, like if you're looking at a, a seal, if you're looking at it, even any normal inscription, I mean, it's going to be protected right in a case. Um, and you can't, you know, you can, you know, see it from afar or whatever, but Hezekiah's tunnel, you can experience it. I mean, you can walk through the whole distance, uh, Gihon Spring, all the way to the end. And, and you feel like you're you're walking through the Bible. I mean, the same tunnel. I mean, Hezekiah's men, I mean, you touch the side and it was their picks that were carving that. And I, I just I just like that connection and just 
feeling like the distance has been reduced. And then there's this bonus. When you get to the end of the tunnel, um, you climb out, you're dripping water, whatever, and, and you've arrived at the Pool of Siloam. The water is brought to the Pool of Siloam, and that's the same place where probably a renovation um, was done between the time of Hezekiah and the time of Herod. But that Pool of Siloam is the place where Jesus sent the blind man to wash the mud off his face so that he could receive his sight. Oh, amen to that. Well, Todd, thank you again for coming on the show. Share your expertise and experience, our audience, and I know I'm very grateful for it. Thank you, Henry. Uh, friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. You can hear from the story of Hezekiah's tunnel. At the end, it leads to Jesus, and in a sense, this is the story of the Old Testament. The Old Testament kings, the stories that are given in the scriptures lead us to Christ. And we hope today that this episode of Digging for Truth has encouraged you to believe in the central feature of the Bible, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth.